Hello, we're gonna get started with the one o'clock session that starts in this room. The session's poor, unemployed, and without cash assistance, characteristics, circumstances, and survival strategies of disconnected families. <clears throat> so I think this is a, a great session to start the afternoon with. Um, this session really gives us an opportunity to keep the conversation going in our quest to better understand the families and issues that were the focus of uh, this morning's plenary. Our three presenters this afternoon are gonna give us both a quantitative and qualitative picture of a significant number of families we might consider disconnected. These are families who are poor and not currently employed in the formal labor market, but who are also not receiving cash assistance from TANF. As Acting Assistant Secretary Mark Greenberg noted in his opening remarks yesterday when he kicked off the first day of the conference, it's clear that in the 20 years since the reform of our welfare system, uh, since the reform of our welfare system and the creation of TANF, that reductions in caseload have not translated into a straightforward increase in economic self-sufficiency or in improvements in economic well-being for the families um, who received TANF. There's a growing awareness that there's a significant percentage of families who are very low income, who are not enrolled in TANF, but are also not regularly employed. And ACF is interested in better understanding the needs and circumstances of these families. These three presenters, each looking at these families, uh, families in these circumstances from different perspectives, are gonna help advance our understanding of these issues. Vanessa Sachs will go first. Vanessa is a research scientist at Child Trends who focuses on youth development issues. She's an expert on using the National Survey of Children's Health, which she uses to look at a lot of questions related to today's session. Vanessa will be giving us a sense of what the geographical distribution of these families is across the country, giving us a picture of the prevalence of disconnected families in, um, by state. <clears throat> Brittany McGill will go next. She's an associate director at Insight Policy Research in the Family Support Division. She has 15 years of experience in research on families, nutrition, and health research. Early in her career, she also did a stint in my office, which is the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation in the Administration for Children and Families. Brittany is gonna help anchor our understanding of these disconnected families by looking deeper into the growth of the numbers of families who are receiving SNAP um, who report zero income. And Kristen Seifelt will be the final presenter. Kristen's an associate professor of social work and public policy at the University of Michigan. Kristen's overseen and man <clears throat> managed a number of studies that have explored how big public policy um, and economic changes have affected very low-income families, including an early welfare lever study and a more recent study examining the effects of the recession on low-income families in Michigan. Kristen's gonna give us an in-depth and up-close perspective on the role that relationships with men play in the lives of disconnected single mothers. So starting off with Vanessa. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Okay, great. Uh, so as Kim said, I'm Vanessa Sachs. I'm a research scientist at Child Trends, and today I'm presenting the results of an analysis that I and my colleagues uh, conducted um, called Poor, Unemployed, and Not on Welfare, the Prevalence of Disconnected Families by State. Um, and my, I uh, wrote this along with my colleagues Laurel Stickler, David Murphy, and Chris Moore with funding from the Annie Casey Foundation. So a quick overview, I'm going to start with a description of the data that we used and some definitions of how, um, the population that we looked at. Then I'll talk about um, the prevalence of children in disconnected families nationally and by state, and then compare um, the children in disconnected families to children in other families um, that are living at or below the federal poverty line. Uh, so the data we used for this is the National Survey of Children's Health. As Kim mentioned, um, we used the 2011-2012 data. It's a data set that's sponsored by the Maternal and uh, Child Health Bureau and HHS. It's representative of children at the national and state levels. So data is collected in all 50 states, D.C., and the Virgin Islands. Um, it's conducted through by telephone between uh, February 2011 and June 2012 and conducted in several different languages. The 2011-2012 data has 95,677 children ages zero to 17 in the data set, um, including 1,800 interviews in each of the 50 states, DC and the Virgin Islands. So we took advantage of this kind of unique data set that's representative at both the state and national levels to look at disconnection among uh, poor families. So. 
the way we define disconnected is um, children in a household where the household income is less than or equal to 100% of the federal poverty level, where no one in the household had received any cash assistance from a state or county welfare program in the past 12 months. And so for shorthand, I'll just be referring to that as TANF throughout the presentation. Um, and that no one in the household had been employed for at least 50 out of the last 52 weeks. So let's first look at the prevalence of children in disconnected families. Uh, nationally, about 30% of children in poor families are disconnected by our definition. And in the vast majority of states, so in 44 states and DC, the percent of children in disconnected families is about the same as the national average, um, with a few exceptions. So the percentage of um, children who are in disconnected families is actually significantly lower in Alaska and Montana, where it's 22% of poor children, in Hawaii, where it's 20%, Vermont, where it's 19 and then in Maine, where only 17% of poor children are in disconnected families. Uh, the only state with a higher percentage of disconnected children is in Texas, where 42% of children in poor families are, in dis are disconnected. So when we look at this um, on a map, it does, uh, rates of disconnection do kind of vary geographically, even if these are not necessarily statistically significant um, differences from the national averages. Um, if we divide the states into thirds, states in the south, so those are the red states tend to um, fall into that highest third, uh, where at least 32% um, of children are in poor families are disconnected. And then the states in the lowest third are the green states and tend to um, fall in the upper um, northwest. So we also looked at how the families in these children are getting by. The National Survey of Children Health uh, asks whether anyone in the household is accessing four other public assistance benefit programs. So about three quarters of children in disconnected families are in households where either they or another child is receiving SNAP. Um, about 80% are um, in families where they or another child are receiving free or reduced meals or farms. Uh, a smaller percentage are in families where someone's receiving um, WIC. However, uh, the age of the children, the average age of the children is a little bit higher, so it, um, a lot of the families are not actually eligible for that program. Um, and then finally, you can see that over 90% of um, children in disconnected families are using Medicaid or a children's health insurance program, CHIP. Um, and that question in the survey actually asked specifically about the focal child, so it is the, the child themselves who's receiving Medicaid or CHIP. So what does this look like in the states? Um, uh, in every state, more than 80% of disconnected children um, access at least one of these three programs. We didn't look at um, WIC usage uh, among this in the states just because the numbers get to a point where the estimates are um, not reliable for all the states. So we just focused on Medicaid, CHIP, SNAP, and FARMS. Um, so ma the majority, more than 75% of children in disconnected families in every single state are using Medicaid or CHIP, but it's particularly high in Arkansas, Indiana, and Illinois, where almost all of children in disconnected families are covered by Medicaid or CHIP. Um, SNAP usage is also common in the states, although it's not as high as uh, Medicaid use. So only in California and DC were less than half of children in disconnected families using SNAP. Uh, similarly, farms rates, um, uh, farms usage is quite common, so uh, ranges from 58% of children in Pennsylvania to 93% of disconnected children in Massachusetts. So we then looked at how children in these families compare to their peers in households that also have an income at or below the poverty line. And we broke these children into four groups based on their household TANF use and work status. Um, so that green, or sorry, the orange um, piece of the pie, that 30% is the disconnected group that we've been talking about. Um, the second group is um, the group where it, no one in the household has worked uh, 50 out of the last 52 weeks, but someone in the household is receiving, uh, ca had received cash assistance in the past 12 months, and that's about 11% of children in poor families. 
So that's the no work TANF group. And then almost half, 48%, are in the work no TANF group. Um, and so someone in the household is work, has worked in the last year, but no one is receiving TANF um, in the past year. And then finally, the fourth group is where someone is working in the household and someone is also receiving TANF in the household, and that's another 11% of children in poor families. Um, so if we look at this in the states, in most states, children are similarly distributed across the four groups as they are nationally, with a few exceptions. Um, so in Alaska, D.C., and Maine, more children are in families that are using TANF, regardless of whether someone is working or not, um, than the national average. In three other states, a higher percentage of children um, are in families that are not working and using TANF. Um, and so nationally, there's 11% of poor children are in that group, whereas in Vermont, it's 31%, Pennsylvania, it's 22%, and in West Virginia, it's 19%. When we compare uh, the disconnected to other poor children, we do see some differences across the groups in terms of their public assistance use. Again, looking at um, starting with Medicaid or CHIP use, you can see the rates of usage are, are high across all the groups. Um, the, um, the work no TANF group has a slightly smaller percentage of children who are receiving this, 86% versus 91. Okay. Speed it up a little, I'm getting the warning. Okay, so um, at the state level, uh, we, we compared the disconnected to all other children, poor children combined, sorry, all other poor children combined, that's important. Um, so we did not break out the four groups, uh, but we see that in almost all the states, the disconnected families, uh, children in disconnected families access Medicaid or CHIP at similar rates to their uh, other poor, children, um, but there are higher rates of usage in South Carolina, nationally as we just discussed, and then in Colorado. Um, children in disconnected families are more likely to receive SNAP than children in households that are working and not using TANF, um, and ha the rates among those um, in households where there, someone is accessing TANF are much higher, so 94 and 95 percent, versus 71 percent in the disconnected group. Um, in almost all states and nationally, children in the disconnected uh, families have similar rates of SNAP usage as other poor families, um, with a couple exceptions. You'll start to see a trend here. So um, in Arizona, 86% uh, of um, disconnected children are accessing SNAP. In Louisiana, it's 81%, so that's higher than other poor children. And it's lower in Maryland, California, and D.C. Uh, and looking at farms, again, um, the disconnected families are less likely to uh, be accessing farms than children and families that are using TANF. And when we look at that at the state level, it's only in D.C. that disconnected children have higher rates of farm use than um, other poor children. Looking at families that access multiple benefits, uh, nationally, just under half of children in disconnected families receive um, all three of the um, programs that uh, the National Survey of Children's Health asks about, um, and that's similar to other children in poor families. Um, but in two states, again, Louisiana and Arizona, um, children in disconnected families are more likely than other poor children to be receiving all three of these programs. Um, and in Maine, D.C., and Colorado, they are less likely than other poor children to be receiving all three programs. Um, and in Colorado, that's only 23% of disconnected children are accessing all three. Um, so just in closing, I'll say disconnection is common in the U.S., um, nationally and in most states. Uh, disconnected children in all states are relying on at least one, if not um, multiple other programs to get by. And although states often look similar to the national averages, there are some key differences that warrant attention from state decision makers, policy makers, um, program staff when they're thinking about how to reach these children since they are a particularly vulnerable population. So with that, wrap it up. Thank you. Yes. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Brittany McGill. Um, as Kim mentioned, I'm from Insight Policy Research. I'm here with my co-author, Brian, up here in the front. And we're going to talk to you about um, another disconnected population. Um, we're looking in particular at the SNAP population. So here, um, we're looking at the zero income SNAP caseload. Um, and we've seen a large growth in this population. So that's who we're looking at. And so when I say zero income SNAP, we're looking at folks that are currently on SNAP, or at least at the time of the data collection, um, and they have no gross income. So zero gross income, um, so they're not participating in TANF, they don't have any cash um, assistance benefits of any type, and they don't have earned income um, or any other form of income. Uh, so I just want to start out and acknowledge um, our other co-authors are shown on this slide. And the results I'm presenting today are part of a much larger study funded by the Food and Nutrition Service. So it was a large multi-methods study. Um, so I, I can't possibly cover everything in the 12 to 15 minute slot I was allotted. So I will say I'm going to highlight just some of the key findings from a few components of the study. Um, and then I'll circle back at the end and um, try to talk about some of the conclusions from the full study. So I will gloss over a few things fairly quickly but I'm happy to go into details with folks afterwards as well. Okay, so this graph really shows the growth that motivated this study. So what this slide shows is the proportion of the SNAP caseload um, that are households with zero gross income. Um, and as you can see, this more than doubled between 1993 and 2012. So just over um, a fifth of the zero income, of the SNAP caseload had zero income. So FNS really wanted to understand, well, what's behind this growth? You know, who are these households? What supports do they have? Um, and that sort of thing to better understand this population. Population. So the research questions we're going to look at are just a subset of the full research questions. Um, but to better understand why this population is increasing, we wanted to look at the characteristics of this population, both now and in the past, have they changed? Um, and also understand um, really how these folks get by, what are their survival strategies, their coping strategies. Um, we looked at several SIP panels, so the 93 to 2008 SIP panels. Um, we did a repeated cross-sectional analysis as well as a longitudinal. Um, as you can imagine, this is one of the data limitations. At the time we did the analysis, the 2008 was the most recent data we had available. We would love to update that. Um, and we also did a qualitative um, component where we did some in-depth interviews with 50 zero-income SNAP participants um, in you know, five states in this area. So let me start with what are the characteristics of um, these families and how have they changed over time? So I'm going to highlight just a few of the key trends we found. Um, it, the first one we noticed really was that more and more single parent families here are, are zero income. So if we look at all the zero income SNAP participants over time, a much smaller proportion of them in the 90s, as you might imagine, had zero income. There was obviously more reliance on cash assistance. Um, and that has gone up, uh, up a bit in the 2000s and then came down slightly to just under half in 2008 of zero income SNAP folks were single parent families. By complement, as you might imagine, the proportion of zero income SNAP families that were childless um, decreased over time. So it was a little over half in 96 were childless households, um, down to just over a third in 2008. Another trend we looked at was the ABOD. So this, of course, is the able-bodied adults without dependents. And here we sort of an approximate measure from SIP. We're looking at um, adults who do not receive disability um, benefits, do not self-report a disability, um, and who do not have children in the home. So this is our approximate measure of ABOD here. Um, and we see a, you know, a stronger U-shaped trend here. So as you might imagine, after welfare reform, we saw a sharp decline. You know, their participation was much more um, limited for programs. Um, but then in the later in the 2000s, those restrictions on ABOD participation um, relaxed a bit. So we see a little bit more. So almost a third in 2008 of the zero income SNAP participants were, um, would be classified as ABODs with this definition. So, and this slide shows also that these zero income SNAP families were increasingly likely over this time period to have had um, cash assistance in the past. So, they're not receiving it now, obviously, they're zero income. Um, but in 93, only 8% of our zero income SNAP folks um, had received AFDC in the past, but we're not currently receiving it. And that went up to a fifth in 2008. So, you know, a lot more of a history of SNAP receipt, uh, TANF receipt, excuse me. 
So that gives us at least a brief historical picture of, of the trends in the demographics here. But we wanted to know, okay, well, what are the circumstances of zero income SNAP participants? So we looked at a couple things. So just to highlight first something from our longitudinal analysis. So here we wanted to understand um, how long, so if you're, uh, you're receiving SNAP and you have zero income, you know, how long is that period without income? Is it a long-term experience? Is it a short-term? And so one of our key findings was that these periods of having no income tend to be fairly short. So the median was three months um, without income while on SNAP, and the vast majority, the 94% of these zero income SNAP periods or episodes were shorter than one year. Um, and we also looked at how often, sort of how cyclical it is. So do you go on and off of this experience? You get income and then you lose it and then you get it again. Um, and you know, we found that it was actually, it's not, doesn't tend to be a repeated occurrence um, in, you know, in, these, in these data. So only about two thirds experience, experienced only one period during a 32 month study period. Okay, so why is that? So why do, what, what brings folks to having uh, the circumstances of having no income? And one of the key themes was really barriers to employment. So here I'm talking about primarily about findings from our qualitative data collection, our interviews with zero income SNAP participants. And so um, barriers to entry, I think everyone in this room is probably familiar with those. So we saw some you know, really limited skills and education and insufficient training and work experience made it really challenging for this population um, to, to get employed. Um, once they did have a job, you know, there are obviously there are barriers to maintaining employment. So um, we had a lot of reports of poor health, um, also a lot of work-related injuries that led to disability um, in our study population. And then, as you might imagine, barriers to re-entry as well. So um, the common sort of dependent care and transportation, those were barriers to getting back into the labor force as well as just gaps in employment, you haven't been employed a while, it's harder to get a job again. Um, and we also had some reports of criminal history in our, in our study population made it really challenging um, to get back into the labor force. So, but it was, it was never just really one thing that made it really difficult and that brought them to zero income. So the, the folks that we talked to really faced multiple challenges. And often these challenges really cascaded where one barrier led to another, led to another. It was sort of a spiraling situation. Um, to get them to the point of really having no income here. So one respondent, for example, reported, well, I lost my job, I lost my apartment, then I lost the car, I lost everything, I lost all that in one year. Uh, so really just this severe spiraling into these sort of dire circumstances. Um, but we also heard a lot of um, disabling injuries and reduced employability. This was a common theme in our data too. So um, one respondent reported how um, you know, getting injured on the job and said, well, you know, they gave me a little bit of compensation, but it didn't last. All at once I had to pay five months of rent that I owed and the money went away and I was left with nothing, uh, with my arm messed up. So she could not get another job very easily. So we also wanted to talk to them about, well, what are your other supports? How do you get by? So we talked about the participation in other federal assistance programs. Um, so thinking about the, ca the sources of cash assistance uh, and employment insurance, um, most had never applied or they were uncertain about eligibility or they had been discouraged. So one respondent reported, well, I worked there for over three years. I don't know how long you have to be at a job to collect it. I thought you could get it. You could be there for a year and collect it, but they told me after they let me go and I called them, they said there's nothing for me to collect. Um, so this was not a source of support for folks in our respondent population. Um, but many also spoke of disabling conditions, um, and so, but we did not see much SSI receipt as well. So uh, the themes we heard were that they were denied or discouraged from applying for SSI. Um, or in one case, the, the box here at the bottom is a woman who suffered from chronic kidney disease. Um, she lost her job after she was hospitalized a few times. Um, and she says, well, I applied for disability in October of last year, and I got my denial letter in February or March. It was time for me to fill out an appeal, but I got sick again, and I missed the deadline. She found it very difficult to get, uh, to get and hold a job with her recurrent doctor's appointments. Okay, so next I want to talk about some of the, the real the survival strategies and what we learned, you know, how do um, these folks get by once they're in this situation. And what we really heard is really consistent with this literature on this erosion of the public safety net. Folks really relied on the personal safety net. They relied on family and friends for housing, for informal um, earnings, for you know, food, uh, for cash. And they really felt indebted to those that supported them, so they repaid them with whatever um, they had to repay them. And so oftentimes, these are SNAP participants, so they oftentimes would share their food with others in the household with the food they got with their SNAP benefits. 
Um, they'd also use cash from odd jobs to, to help pay some bills or provide some in-kind support such as childcare. So this informal work, these odd jobs, was very common among our um, respondents. Um, they often earned money from things like cleaning houses or doing hair or yard work, um, but really this was not a steady source of income. Um, and you know, obviously our respondents at the time of the, the study were not receiving any income when they applied for SNAP. Um, and so income from these jobs was really often shared with these folks that were helping to support them um, or put towards housing or food. But really, what we found was that food insecurity was quite common in this population. So although they were receiving SNAP benefits, most could not extend them through the end of the month. So often they skipped or reduced meals, uh, reduced the size of their meals, especially at the end of the month when these benefits had run out. So this respondent here, she's talking about how, um, you know, well, she would feed the kids that come to their house. I was raised to, to share food with folks when they come to the house. And so she would eat cereal or skip meals when the kids come around, and they come around every weekend. Okay, so I want to fast forward here and you know, talk about just some of our overarching conclusions from this study. Again, sort of our conclusions here draw from both the results I've talked about as well as um, a policy and economic analysis that was part of this study where we really looked at the economic conditions and the policies and their association with these trends in zero income SNAP over time. But overall, what we found is that this increase in this zero income, this disconnected SNAP population is consistent with the other research on just worsening economic conditions and lack of economic recovery among the most disadvantaged. So even during periods of economic improvement, these most disadvantaged folks are really not benefiting from those gains. Um, but this growth also reflects a growth in the broader population. Uh, so Vanessa's talked about the, the population as well. We see this in a few different populations. So the, the red line you see here is the increase I've been talking about. It's the increase in the SNAP population with zero income over time. Uh, the blue line is the increase if we look just at the low income population. So anybody with under 200% of the poverty level. So that increase really tracks the same SNAP line. But even if you look at the overall U.S. population with no income limits, you know, everybody, um, it has gone up quite dramatically during this time period to, uh, from about 1% to almost 3% um, during this time period. So it is a broader trend at the macro level. And so the two themes that we found that really contributed to, to this growth, one is, you know, th these barriers to employment really making it difficult to, to have, you know, to enjoy the, the benefits from an economic recovery. So the unemployment rate we found was very strongly associated with uh, zero income SNAP incidents, um, but also these themes of poor health and disability um, and other barriers like the limited education, dependent care, transportation made it difficult, um, as well as just job volatility. So the nature of very low wage work and the volatility of that made it very difficult uh, to maintain employment. So, and then finally, this erosion of the public safety net was really a common theme across the components of our study. So, um, you know, increasingly folks relying on a private safety net on family and friends, and less so on a public safety net. So, we saw this in the increase in the, the past history of receiving AFDC or TANF, but they are no longer. Uh, we see this, you know, more and more single parent families here are, are zero income. They're not receiving cash assistance, whereas they would have received, a, would more likely have received AFDC or TANF in the past. Uh, and also just this low reliance on the public assistance program, so not much in SSI or UI and that sort of thing. Um, but another factor here was the increase in the eligibility of ABODs in the 2000s. So obviously we saw you know, a decline in ABODs participation in these assistance programs after welfare reform. Uh, and then those restrictions were um, uh, loosened a bit in the 2000s. So that has contributed somewhat to the growth of the share of ABOD participants as well. Thank you. Um, the, t the work I'm going to talk about uh, today is joint with Heather Sandstrom at the Urban Institute, so I want to acknowledge her. Um, so, you know, we all know that there is a small but still very much growing number of uh, households in which uh, there's no source of cash coming in, either from work or from TANF, TANF benefits. Um, if we look at just the immediate income of those families and we look at just what the mother herself reports, um, it's quite low. Qu 
quite low indeed. Um, when you add in other household members, though, incomes go up, you know, so potentially uh, suggesting that these mothers and these families have access to more resources. Additionally, mothers also might be receiving contributions from people outside the household, um, and that might not actually show up on, on survey data where we're asking about household incomes. And one you know, subset of that help might be from non-custodial or other partners, um, and you know, that's something to consider, but we also know from a long uh, literature about relationships, cohabiting relationships in particular, that these, uh, that receiving the support might be a source of stress, and this is sort of the issue we want to examine. Um, so why, why are we focusing on men? Why use this sort of gendered and uh, admittedly heterosexist language? Um, well, first of all, you know, from a policy standpoint, we think that, um, you know, that men should be providing help from the standpoint of helping out their biological children, right? That's why we have the child support program. Um, but we also know that child support collection rates are quite low, and that for the population we're talking about, the men uh, who would uh, receive these child support orders are often unemployed or have you know, very low, if not any, earnings at, at all. Uh, we also have an assumption to that to the extent that people are in cohabiting relationships, that the cohabiting partner is providing um, income, but we don't actually know whether or not that's true, these partners might have obligations outside of the household, particularly if they have children um, uh, with other r women. Um, and we also know that compared to uh, a married relationship, cohabiting relationships are much more unstable. They don't tend to, la to last as long. So what we're trying to address um, in our analyses here is to look at three different questions. You know, first, what types of support do disconnected mothers receive from the men in their lives? How does that fit in with their larger economic coping strategies? Um, second, how do they think about those and evaluate the contributions that men make? Is it viewed as crucial? Is it an extra? Um, and is it a, a source of, of stress for these women? Um, and then how should we think about these contributions, you know, as, as researchers, as, as policymakers, as those who, who run programs? You know, are they an adequate substitute for income from, from earnings or, or public assistance? So our approach was to conduct um, in-depth interviews with a sample of 51 mothers who'd experienced at least one spell of disconnection, uh, which we, in the prior two years, and which we defined as at least six cumulative months of unemployment, at which time there was no um, TANF or UI received during those uh, months, and no receipt of SSI from the mother, although someone else in the household could have received SSI. We found our mothers um, through two studies that both Heather and I were involved, involved in at the time. Uh, so in LA, the Best Start Community Evaluation that the Urban Institute was conducting, and in Michigan, the Michigan Reco uh, Recession and Recovery Study, which I'm involved in. Um, we identified potentially eligible uh, respondents from survey data and then we contacted them and further screened them um, to make sure that they fit our eligibility criterion. And as I'll talk about in just a moment, cohabitation with a partner wasn't a, an exclusion criteria. Uh, we did our interviews in the summer and fall of 2013, 29 in LA, 22 in Southeast Michigan, almost all of the interviews were done uh, in respondents' homes or the homes in which they were living at the time. So I, I realize this is um, a lot of information on one table. It's a comparison of the demographic characteristics of our sample. What you should take away is that in LA, the sample was overwhelmingly Latina immigrant uh, and women who were cohabiting with a partner. They also might have been doubled up with other family members as well. In Michigan, the sample was overwhelmingly African-American, non-immigrant. These women tended not to be living uh, with a romantic partner. They were also a little bit older, and mo more of them had more recent work experience compared to the LA population. So let's you know, put their sources of support more broadly in context. And you know, what I'll tell you, uh, you know, reflects what Brittany said. You know, 
Most of the respondents were on SNAP and Medicaid, or at least their children were receiving health insurance, um, even in the immigrant families. Um, people who were eligible for, for WIC got WIC on behalf of their children. Um, 10 Michigan households were receiving some form of housing assistance. Uh, several uh, children in these households were receiving SSI. Uh, one woman uh, had started receiving and two uh, women uh, received assistance from other disability programs. There's some extra income brought in from side jobs, um, you know, which Brittany talked about as well. Help from family members was more common in Michigan than in LA. Um, nevertheless, despite you know, packaging together all of these different sources of income, um, experiences of, har of hardship, and in particular housing-related hardship, were very common. So where does the support from men fit into this? Um, so as I said earlier, women in LA tended to live with a romantic partner. Um, and for most of these women, you know, that was very important economically. Um, however, their partners worked very unsteady jobs. Some of them worked under the table. Um, and there were often long, long spells of unemployment. Um, so this was only providing you know, limited protection economically. Further, a few women kind of expressed ambivalence about being in this relationship. Uh, Christina talked about how she'd been with her partner for 17 years, but she wouldn't marry him uh, because uh, she thought it would be easier to leave if she wasn't married and she was giving herself um, that out. Um, for example, she said, I'd only marry if I met someone with money, um, which her, her partner did not really have. And then uh, one reason we wanted to make sure we included some women who were in cohabiting relationships in, in our study is a concern that perhaps women were staying with men because they had nowhere else to go. And in fact, a few women in LA said that they were only living with this particular man because there was no other option. They, had, they couldn't see anywhere else where they could go and get help and remain housed. On the other hand, um, there were men who were providing you know, very generous financial support. So in Michigan, half of, of fathers were paying for all of the expenses associated with their children. And that's, I'm gonna stress that they're biological children, not necessarily all of the children in the woman's household. Um, it wasn't formal child support, but rather um, buying clothes, paying the fees associated with various activities their kids might be in, or providing other extras you know, for that child or children. In five instances, um, men were paying all of the bills for this disconnected household. So Kiana you know, described what her uh, ex-partner was doing, you know, he says the rent's $700, you figure light and gas is between $200 and 250 the kids' cell phones, you know, $200, miscellaneous, you know, maybe 300 he he'll maybe pay $300 and $400 a month. Um, now, Kiana's three children um, were all the biological children of, of this ex-partner, uh, which might have made it more easy for him to do this. Um, but he had, as she said later, stepped up to the plate when she lost her job, lost her unemployment insurance, and was time limited off of TANF. And for those of you who might have been uh, here in the morning session, um, one thing that definitely emerged in the interviews were people talked about sort of the emotional consequences of taking this help and the toll it sometimes took. So Kiana, you know, who had this you know, generous financial support, you know, said that she often felt like people in her network were talking about her, you know, behind her back. So saying, oh, she's not working, she's living off her baby daddy, you know, just stuff like that. Um, Janice talked about a, a real loss of autonomy. She said, sometimes it's stressful because I like my own money. I like to be my own boss. Sometimes when you're asking someone for something or someone does something, you know, then they feel like you have, they have some sort of control over you, and sometimes that bothers me. Moreover, um, this generous support or any support that women might be receiving from men um, could disappear really quickly. And so we saw that in LA in a few instances when the partner was deported. Um, Diana was just one of those, you know, she said it was really hard, everything got harder 
Um, she was on her own uh, once her partner had been deported. Um, Gina's partner died unexpectedly, and he had, you know, she said he was, his support was a lot of her income. You know, that's where I was getting a lot of my income. You know, he would pay my bills and stuff. And he had recently passed about a month before the, the interview, and she was really at kind of her wit's end trying to figure out what she was going to do. Of course, there were some women who were, um, you know, receiving very minimal help. Um, their partners had been deported years previously. Some women reported that their partners were incarcerated and couldn't provide any financial help. Formal um, child support payments were rare, and when they were in place, they were erratic and quite low. And a few women said they just didn't want anything to do with their former partner and wouldn't ask uh, him for, for help. And then finally, you know, for a few women, any help that they got from a, a romantic partner, you know, some occasionally would come with strings attached to it. So Ginger talked about how a man who she sometimes called her boyfriend but sometimes didn't, you know, didn't feel like he was her boyfriend, you know, would sort of pressure her for, for sex, you know, just because she said, you know, he bought me eight rolls of tissue paper and some dish rags and stuff. You know, this expectation that she had to negotiate uh, every time he, he helped her out. So what's, what's the takeaway? Um, you know, Men can play an important role in the economic coping strategies of women during periods of disconnection, um, but it's varied and it's very complicated. Um, some provided significant help, um, although there was sometimes a cost associated with that. You know, at a minimum, a loss of autonomy on the part of the woman, and you know, at the very worst, keeping women in bad relationships um, because they had no other options. Also important, you know, financial stability provided by these men could end very quickly through a job loss, through a death, through a deportation, um, through an incarceration. And, you know, and that's you know part of the larger um, story as well. You know, their financial lives are very, very complicated. Um, and when we think about what we know about families from the data, um, you know, we might not be capturing a lot of this help in our administrative data, in our surveys. You know, in particular, when there's someone, a male partner or even someone else, who's just taking over payments of, of bills altogether. Um, so by not accounting for this, maybe we're overstating um, the extent to which families uh, have very low economic resources. Um, but, you know, again, assuming that this income is, is stable and that it can be accessed for long periods of time um, really, I think, would overstate um, the amount of resources that they, these families help, these families have. Um, it is likely, although of course we can't say for sure from the study design, that without the help that women receive from men, they would have experienced you know, more hardship than they did. But in the end, you know, what women said, you know, nearly 201, is what they wanted was to have a job and not have to rely on help from their private safety nets. Um, so we need to keep, you know, keep in mind, you know, that even though help might be available, this is not, you know, what people really want. What they really want um, is a job. Um, so I'll end with that, although I want to um, acknowledge our project officers for this project, Emily Schmidt and Matt Boris, um, who's no longer at, at HHS, um, for their support uh, for the data collection and initial analyses. Um, and of course, the views represented here do not necessarily reflect those of, of OPRE, but we thank them for all the assistance they provided during this project. Happily, we have a lot of time left for questions. So um, there are two microphones, one here and one over there. So please make your way to the microphone. Um, I think this is a question for Vanessa, but I was interested in the data points about DC and the disconnected poor here. And I was wondering why or if you, if you know why so many of the disconnected poor in DC have such low f um, SNAP, or s SNAP, or they, why, why they don't use SNAP more, or if that's just 
the problem we often have of comparing DC to states, and does DC look more like other cities, or is there something weird going on here that isn't totally understood? Yeah, so we, we couldn't really look at that so much in our, um, with the, the data that we had. I mean, of course, DC has its own sort of unique challenges. Um, uh, so it's, we could make lots of guesses, but I can't give you a very satisfying answer, unfortunately. Hi, Elizabeth Flowerbash at CLASP. In the study of the SNAP uh, zero-income households, I was one, you did the descriptive analysis at the beginning with the types of families, and I was wondering if later you looked separately at the ABODs and the families with kids, because they're obviously in a somewhat different dynamic with the families with kids, at least in theory, should be eligible for TANF, maybe, whereas um, for the childless adults, they may well not be eligible for anything else. So I was just interested in that. Sure, that would be really interesting. You know, no, unfortunately, we didn't look um, specifically at ABODs as their own uh, subgroup. It was sort of a very large, all-encompassing study. So the, the comparisons we made were sort of looking at zero-income SNAP to other um, you know, positive-income SNAP, so SNAP folks that had some form of income, as well as um, uh, the other iterations of that. So no SNAP and no income, and then positive income, but no SNAP. So those are the comparisons we made, but that would be a very interesting um, extension of this to yeah. look specifically at them. Certainly right now, obviously, the ABODs are very policy relevant, and particularly Absolutely. the notion that those periods of disconnection from the workforce are short, even when there aren't time limits being imposed, would be interesting to understand better. Sure, absolutely. Uh, thanks for the panel and for the presentation of the research. I feel like I'm just going to be a, repeating myself through the different panels today. But you talked a little bit in the plenary session this morning about the impact on kids. And I wonder if you could comment about the impact on child well-being as a result of disconnection from these systems in, in, in a way. And, and even of the impact of the engagement of some of the fathers and the families and what's that, what that as difficult as that might have been for the moms, do we know anything about what that meant for the kids? Um, I think that to the extent that, you know, as Kiana put it, you know, her ex-partner really stepped up to the plate and, and helped out, it did help. I mean, it wasn't just that money was coming into the house, but he was coming into the house as well. Um, I mean, she may, said that they'd maintained a cordial relationship, but um, you know, he had found the place for them to live and kind of set set them up there, and he became a regular presence in you know in their lives. You know, another time I was at a house uh, where. Uh, the woman's youngest child was, you know, brought home from an activity by his father. You know, she didn't have the money to uh, pay for him to, you know, play softball. I think it was, but you know, dad came in and and helped out. Um, you know, we did not ask systematically ab about that um, and whether or not, you know, some of this was a change because of, you know, of disconnection. But I would say, you know. From based on what I observed and other things that women told me, again, it varied. You know, for some, it was it was a good a good thing. You know, maybe bringing the father cl more closely into the family. In other cases, it was you know it wasn't um, you know it wasn't good for anybody, mother or kids. Um, so I, I I work in state state government programs, and so we take a lot of heat for sort of siloed. Programming and we should, <laughs> and we should fix that. Um, but uh, in the last couple of days, I, I feel like we have some siloed research too, and I think that has to mm -hmm. also be part of the solution. Because if you look at separate research around engagement of fathers and what that means in terms of kids' development yeah. and how they become more playful and external in the world and have different kinds of relationships and learn to explore and the impact of consistent, safe, stable relationships of dads. I feel like we need to put together a little bit of the income, the understanding of income of father engagement and the 
and the understanding of kid impact in some ways too. So I don't know if you experienced the research in that siloed way, but I'd be interested in your, your comments. No, I think, I think that is, you know, a great point to make. And, you know, I think for so long, you know, both in our programs, we focus on the single mother household, um, but also, in, you know, that in research as well. And I think, you know, going into this project, you know, if I had just relied on, on the, the literature out there, what it would have said is like, you know, these guys go away, right? You know, the fragile families study sort of has, you know, indicates that, you know, the partner is there for the birth of the child, but if they if they don't get married, the relationship quickly dissolves. And you know, I don't. It, I think it's we are asking the questions that kind of capture in surveys some of these other kinds of ways that that you know the fathers of ch of children might be involved. And I think you know, I think it is a completely valid valid criticism. You know that we we do you know. I'm a researcher who looks at poor moms and their kids, you know, but doesn't doesn't consider dads. Um, and yeah, we do we do need to think more holistically, and also you know not just you know the fathers, but more extended family too. Uh, just a, one add-on: we did as a related analysis to the one that I presented here. We did look at um, the well-being of children using the same data set. Um, the National Survey of Children's Health has a lot of data about health and well-being of children and compared the four groups um, that I described. And, um, you know, we don't see a lot of striking differences between the disconnected group and the other poor families. But, of course, there's big differences um, emerging even in this 0 to 17 um, age group between the poor families and the non-poor families. So um, that's only, you know, we only looked at the national level, but that's another brief on the Child Trends website if you're interested in more. Hi, Russ Sykes from APHSA. I'm just curious with the without cash assistance title in this, did you look at the different reasons they may be without cash assistance, either they timed out or did they miss this, they timed out or they failed to comply with, with the requirement, maybe child support cooperation or work, uh, or they were eligible but simply didn't apply because of other resources, or, or was, there, was it all over the map? So in our, and I did leave this, this out of the presentation, um, in our LA sample, um, again, a primarily immigrant sample, although not all undocumented, there was a sense that like they weren't going to be eligible, even if their kids were. And part of that was, you know, a number of women talked about TANF not being safe, that they would have to repay, they, they thought that they would have to repay their, the benefits they'd received later on the road, or their kids would have to be, repay the benefits, or do military service, so there, there was, Definitely within this community, there were some, some understandings, right or wrong, that you know, this was not a program for them at all. In Michigan, um, the story was more about time limits. Um, the state was kind of late to the game in implementing time limits, and a good, it's about half of these women timed out, um, and a few others uh, lost benefits because of um, inability to, to comply with with work requirements, usually because of a very significant health problem and not being able to get on SSI. No. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a clarification question. This is kind of a new topic to me and I'm trying to wrap my mind around the idea that um, you can be zero income, but then have side jobs or live with someone who is supporting you. So I would assume that they have an income. And maybe you mentioned this and I just mentioned or missed it, but I was hoping you could explain that a little more. Sure. So it's a, uh, well, it's complicated. So one is, um, you know, a lot of our, um, our, our zero income interviews were folks who at the time they, so to sample them, we went to SNAP administrative data. So at the time that they um, applied for SNAP, they did not have income. So some, and then by the time we sort of sampled them and brought them on board and we conducted the interview, some of them may have gotten jobs that they didn't have at the time. 
Um, so that's one reason, it's just a temporal disconnect between data collection and you know, when we measured zero income. Um, the other could be that it is you know, so infrequent in odd jobs that it was either was not reported or did not have to be reported. So it gets a little murky when um, in the reporting requirements at that point, so. Yeah, I tend to think of it as, you know, the household unit that we recognize in our programs is not necessarily what the household is. And, you know, what what is income, really? Like, if I get $10 from shoveling someone's sidewalk, you know, once a month when there's a snowstorm, is that really, you know, is that really the same as having a paycheck or having a, a welfare check come in? You know, for, in many cases, that isn't reportable income, but you know, people have to have some source of, of cash coming, coming in. Um, zero, I think, is really an artifact of how we think about whether or not it's, you know, reportable or if someone thinks it's, it's reportable. Sure, and I should also add, so with, um, with SNAP, um, the, the way the, the SNAP household is defined is folks that purchase and prepare food together. So that's when we think of the SNAP household. So there could be other folks in the household that have, you know, living in the same household who have income and are helping to support them, but you know, do not count as the SNAP. So you receive SNAP benefits on behalf of the folks in your SNAP unit within a larger household. So in some cases, you know, you have to count the other, you know, I believe it's if it's, um, um, you know, under a certain age and living with your parents, you have to count your parents' income, you know, even if your income is under a certain level. But for the most part, we're looking at just the, the unit that purchases and prepares food together and looks at their income and eligibility requirements. Hi, so I'm Rochelle Finsland. I'm with the National Conference of State Legislatures. And so I'm coming at this from a little different perspective and this, this conversation around disconnected families is very fascinating, and, I, and I'm thinking of the policy implications. And certainly there are uh, a lot of folks who don't necessarily want the answer to be to reconnect, because there is this notion or a desire to really, you know, for them, success is reducing the caseloads and getting people off SNAP and, and everything else. So I'm trying to think of how then the other pieces of information that you're finding in terms of really this desire to work and that there, you know, there's a motivation to do that, but yet we can't seem to make that happen. And we hear about career pathways, we hear about some of the other subsidized jobs, and I'm not hearing that they're having great effects. And so I'm just wondering your perspective in terms of where are some of those policy levers that can actually make a difference, tap into their, their personal motivation, um, as well as, you know, sort of taking advantage of um, the political context, for lack of a better term. Uh, well, I can say that's a great question, and I know that's a question that, you know, ACF and other agencies are really looking at now, so I know that there are, um, there are two very, you know, rigorous um, studies going on right now looking at employment, the impact of employment and training programs. So there's one within ACF looking at the Health Professions Opportunities Grant. So these are programs where they're looking at um, given to, uh, grants given to programs where they're looking at helping to get TANF and other low-income folks into sort of well-paying um, health professions. Um, so the, the grantees typically provide sort of case management and supportive services and, and try to really work with those barriers and address those barriers to get them into employment. So those are sort of just getting off the ground, at least in this second generation with, with um, the HPOG study to really understand what works best, and so hopefully we'll have some really good answers soon. Um, there's also a SNAP ENT study um, that is underway now that should give us some good answers, a very similar looking at the, um, you know, a random assignment study of employment and training for SNAP folks as well. So um, I don't have the best answers, but it's a great question, and I, I think there's some really great research going on that will help answer that. I think, you know, and again, this, this is in the context of, of Michigan, but definitely affected nearly all states at, during the peak of the Great Recession. You know, if, we think, if we think that the rationale for having policies like time limits is to motivate people to get off of, of welfare and, and get jobs, if there are no jobs, then it doesn't seem to me that we should, there's a purpose to have to have time limits in place. So maybe having even just provisions that where time limits are uh, 
you know, not, not in, in effect when the unemployment rate in an area reaches a certain level would be just even like a little sort of first start because, you know, a, a large problem that the women in Michigan were facing was, you know, that economy was very slow to recover and it was going to take a long time to get a new job. And, you know, unless we're going to engage in some really heavy duty macroeconomic policy, um, you know, changes to TANF or changes to food stamps aren't going to, you know, aren't going to help, but people still need a source of income. I guess just to add to the list of sort of promising and interesting things that are going on that maybe aren't proven yet, but that indicate that we're starting to think about things maybe from a different um, lens are, are some of the things that were mentioned this morning um, in terms of, you know, new two-generation approaches and um, incorporating more um, uh, supports for executive function and self-regulation skill development, whether it's through coaching or um, cognitive behavioral therapy and um, even neurofeedback and all kinds of different cognitive brain training. So there is some exciting stuff going on um, in terms of really thinking about that, getting this population connected to work. Um, so I have a question uh, for Kristen about to what extent you think the findings about the contributions, the financial contributions of cohabiting partners are kind of specific to the characteristics of the sample you described, mm -hmm. which you said was largely Latina and immigrant versus more being more generalizable to the low income cohabiting population. And if you've either done work on that or have some you know, thoughts about that, and then also in either direction, kind of why you think that might be. Yeah, I, mean, I think you know, the LA sample there, there's a large sort of cultural element to this, you know, that the co cohabiting relationships of many of these women, you know, were part of a, a tradition in the con their countries of origin of marriage-like relationships. Um, you know, that said, you know, these, their partners weren't always able to provide. So many, many of these cohabiting partners were living in doubled up households, um, whether that be with their parents or with siblings. Um, so it, it, wasn't, it wasn't stable, you know, regardless of, of the nature of the relationship. And I think that is something we know, you know, we know about the instability of, employment for the men, you know, that women who are low income, you know, partner up with. So I think that could be probably generalizable, generalizable to a larger sample of cohabiting women. I have a question for each of you. I would, um, what do you think or what would you like to be the biggest takeaway from the research you presented today? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, am, I, am I going first? <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, it's sort of the, while we can learn, we could learn a lot from what is a pretty unique data set in the National Survey of Children's Health, like, there are a lot of questions, like uh, the question about DC where they're unanswered, and so I would say, um, we just want to know more about um, what uh, the different state, specific state populations are experiencing, um, given the differences we know um, in, in TANF um, rules and regulations in the states and um, how much things have changed in the last you know, 20 years. So um, I would just say a call for, for more knowledge about um, you know, what's going on in the states. Gosh, it's hard to pinpoint one takeaway, but I think especially after this discussion, I think that um, um, thinking about policy levers and what can we do to really help these folks, I think um, one of the big takeaways is that it's really it's a complex phenomenon. So it's not you know one factor that we can you know fix. You know if we just give them this, then they'll be employed and everything will be better. It was sort of like the cascading effect of all these things, the, the complexities of, of, of folks' lives. You know, you have your relationships, you know, a lot like Kristen's, um, talk about the relationships and the complexities of the relationships. You can't easily measure it or easily fix it and they're, 
you know, um, good things and bad things. So um, it's a complex phenomenon, and um, you know, these folks face a lot of different challenges. So I think we need sort of policy levers and solutions from sort of multiple angles to really improve folks' lives. But it's a really important challenge that we need to tackle because clearly this is really affecting an increasing portion uh, of the population. So I don't know if this is a takeaway from my presentation, but I'll answer this in terms of what, what this body of work has been making me think about a lot. And that is, you know, we know from, you know, back in the 70s when Carol Stack did her work that you know, help from friends and families and community members has been a survival strategy for low-income families, you know, forever. However, you know, now that we've you know, pulled away sources of, of support like TANF and made other sources of support like um, SSI hard to get, you know, I think there's some you know, evidence that the private safety net becomes that much more crucial for families. So what is it doing for the people who are providing help? What does this mean for those who are, are giving the help? You know, does it set them back? Are, you know, are they then unable to pay bills? Are we making them worse off financially? Um, I think that's another you know, part of these complex relationships that we need to consider. You know, I think some people I talk to will say, well, that's great. You know, they've got family members who are helping them. They don't need public assistance. Um, well, okay, possibly, but we don't really know much about the circumstances of those who are, you know, serving as, as the de facto safety net, and I think we should know more. I'm going to ask one final question related to that, just kind of springboarding off that. So, <clears throat> Vanessa, you, my question is, what should be a next step for our research? And Vanessa, you implied that we should know more about at the state level and maybe looking more at the interaction between state policy contexts and what's happening with families. Kristen, you said we should know more about the people who are providing the private safety net. And I don't know, Vanessa, if you want to, but is there an, anything additional beyond that that you think should be kind of our next uh, research agenda? Any of you can feel free. As women in the audience uh, strongly recommend it. I do think we need to know a lot more about how it affects kids and, you know, sort of beyond, you know, I think Child Trends has done amazing work to, you know, get us started. But when I think about um, Kathy Eden and, and Luke Schaefer's book, $2 a Day, and, you know, we're able to see some really awful experiences that, that kids go through um, when they're living in families that are, are deeply poor. And you know, many of those deeply poor families are the disconnected. There's strong overlap there. So really understanding like, how being so poor affects kids or beyond some of our more traditional measures of, of, of health and well-being, but more in, in more of a qualitative sense, I guess. Would either of you like to add? I mean, yes, certainly. I think um, <laughs> just given how much we're learning more and more about adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress and how um, constant, you know, being growing up in poverty even just for a few years can have such a ripple effect across um, the life course that, um, yeah, absolutely, I would, I would second that. Likewise, I agree, but... Nothing else to add. Okay, great. Well, let's give our panel another round of applause and appreciate them.